Avaya has changed my life. Avaya has made me the woman I am today. Avaya is my home. Avaya is personal freedom. Avaya is the reason my life continuously improves. Let everyone in your life know about Avaya. Everyone needs to know about this amazing company. Thank you, Avaya, for appearing in my inbox. What Ike Allen and Andy Anderson have created at Avaya is what the world needs. Today, our guest is going to be talking about how to know your divine purpose. I know a lot of us often question in our life what our purpose is, so I'm super excited to dive in. So please welcome Lisa Coffey. Hi, Lisa. Hi, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, absolutely. I love that you're doing this whole conference. I think it's much needed. It is. Absolutely. I'm, I'm super excited about it too. And I, I want to share a little bit about you and your work and then we'll, we'll dive into to confidence and Vedic studies and all sorts of things. So Lisa is a Vedic studies teacher and she's also a best-selling author with 17 titles to her credit. And her latest book is called Song Divine, a new lyrical rendition of the Bhagavad Gita. And she is a sought after guest expert. She appears frequently on television and radio and contributes to many national publications with her insightful and compassionate approach to modern day issues. So Lisa, I'd love it if we could just dive straight into what confidence is to you. Confidence really is knowing who you are. It's uh, being able to walk in your truth, you know, and it sounds like such a simple thing, I, you knowing who you are, right? But we're talking about not knowing, you know, my name is Lisa, I'm a writer, whatever, you know, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a you know, whatever. It's really knowing who you are. And uh, I think a lot of us have that um, kind of searching to us where it's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And so then that we start there, you know, I, and then our job is who we see ourselves as. Right. But there's so much more to it than that. You know, there's so much more to it than that. And I remember um, coming to this conclusion, I was about in college, college age or something. And I kept thinking, well, it, I know it's not just a job. It's, it's a purpose. What am I supposed to do? What is, what am I supposed to do here? And I was looking with um, like psychics and different speakers and I go to different seminars and I'm asking people, what's my purpose? What's my purpose? And they're all like, that's up to you. And I'm like, I have no idea. (laughs) I want you to tell me. And I finally came to the conclusion that you can't seek your purpose outside of you. There's nothing outside of you that can define you, that can define your purpose, that can give you confidence, that it all starts from right within. Mm -hmm. And when you know who you are, you're expressing that best self and then you're naturally confident. You know, you naturally have ease with people and it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. It certainly is. Yeah. So, so I love it. You know, so let's say you get in touch with who you are and, you know, you're being naturally being that confident being, then what are the benefits of being confident as it, you know, relates to our everyday life? Well, first of all, uh, there's no anxiety. There's all the opposite of confident that you don't have, which holds us back fear and anxiety and nervousness and low self-esteem and all that kind of stuff. Those are all self-created obstacles that we put in our way. Um, And they don't have to be there because when you know who you are, you know that you are truly divine, that you are truly powerful, um, that you can have and be and do exactly what you want, that you wouldn't have the thought to do something or the desire to do something if you were inherently capable of achieving it. It wouldn't even occur to you. Mm. So to be able to walk in with that feeling of, you know, yes, it's up to me, but at the same time, I'm supported by all of nature. So all of nature is working for my own best good. And whatever that looks like, I know it's for my own best good. So 
in that way, you can never fail because if something doesn't happen the way you envisioned it, you understand that there's a purpose and a meaning behind it that goes to serve your highest good. Mm -hmm. So you're okay with it. You're not devastated. You're not depressed. You're not, you know, moping around the house going, oh, I failed. I'm a failure. This isn't good. You just go, okay, great. What have I learned from this? What can I do differently next time? Maybe what is the message behind this? Am I going a little bit in the wrong direction? Is there another direction I should be headed? Is there another opportunity that is better for me than this one? So it's, it's not being attached to the outcome. You know what I yes. mean? It's like oh, yeah. we can set goals and we can move on the path. But when we're not attached to the outcome, when we're focused on the path rather than that end game and really improving ourselves and learning and growing all along the way, then when we finally arrive, wherever it is, it may not be exactly where we had, per had envisioned, it's like beautiful. It's beautiful. And that's when people say, oh, it was meant to be, or it was destiny, you know, and that kind of thing. You have to allow for that flow, for that support of nature, rather than going in like, with a, like a bull with both horns and pushing, pushing, fighting, fighting, fighting. Because then you get, you, you open yourself to just being jab, 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 you know, because if that's not meant to be, nature's going to say, hey, what's it going to take to get you to shift? Because this is for your highest good, not this, right? Mm, yeah, I love that. And that, you know, that really, I think, leads to a lot of like trust in, trust in what's happening, trust in how life is unfolding and definitely is a much more, in my experience, peaceful way to live than, yes, fighting the, I'm confident that I'm going to accomplish this goal, but it doesn't happen exactly as I hope to or whatever. And then getting angry or whatever, right? No, it's yeah. all, you know, it's, we don't always know, right? It's like a course of miracles, right? I, I, I think it's, we do not perceive our own best interests, you know, and many other yeah. things, you know, right? Say such things. So I love yeah. that. I mean, I always use the example of, you know, if you have uh, two tennis players playing a match, well, you can bet they both want to win. They're both praying and they're both, you know, training and doing all this stuff, but still only one person can win right? It doesn't mean the person who doesn't win is a failure at all, you know? So right. uh, we have to remember we're all in this together. It's not like, you know, my world, my way, I'm going to make it happen, blah, 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 blah. There's all these moving parts that we don't even know about. Oh, so yeah. taking care of all of us. Nature's not just taking care of me and looking out for what Lisa wants because she's confident, you know. Nature is supporting the whole universe for what's good for everybody and also me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So so let's dive into Vedic studies. What what are what are these studies all about? So this is cool. I got into this uh, actually I started studying with Deepak Chopra back in 97, 98. And um, he introduced me to Vedanta. And Vedanta is like where all of the world's religions sprung from. Vedanta means the highest truth. So out of Vedanta came these other Vedic studies like Jyotish, which is uh, Eastern astrology. It's where astrology really began before the West got its hands on it. So uh, it's astrology that's based on the moon cycles rather than the sun cycles. So it's much more accurate as the um, astrological chart shifts as time goes on. So right now there's about a 20% difference if you get your Eastern chart done versus your Western chart done. So that may change your sign, your sun sign, you know, like I'm a Taurus in Western astrology, but I'm actually an Aries in Jyotish astrology. Mm -hmm. So that kind of gives me a new perspective. And that's one way that we can learn about ourselves. It's like looking at an astrological chart, a Jyotish chart, um, helps us to see what karmas we came into this world with, you know, what, um, 
you know, what lessons we need to learn in this life, where our strengths are, where our challenges are. It just is more for self-knowledge, okay? And then another of the Vedic studies is Ayurveda, mm -hmm. which I love Ayurveda. Ayurveda is the science of life. And in Ayurveda, we look at our constitution, mind and body, and it's made up of the three doshas, vata, pitta, and kapha. And doshas are um, elements in nature because everything in the universe is made up of the five elements, air, space, fire, water, and earth, right? Including us, our body. And so when we find out what elements are more dominant in our physiology and in our mind, then that tells us a lot about our personality, our strengths, our health challenges, those kind of things too. So that's just another way we can learn about ourselves and be more confident knowing who we are, right? Mm -hmm. It also helps us to learn about other people so that we can become better at relationships, so that we understand a person's nature and we're not trying to change that person all the time. So right. that's just another one. So yeah, the... And, you know, meditation is a uh, Vedic study. Um, all of the disciplines within Vedanta and everything promote meditation. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to it, and it's all interrelated. And they're all tools that we can use to help learn about ourselves and our purpose. Mm. So, so that actually leads me. I'm glad you mentioned purpose again. So, so you talk about per, like a person's purpose being divine. What, is that, what does that mean to you? So I think we all have what we call our purposes in our daily, everyday life, right? Like it, if my purpose is to teach or my purpose is to raise a family and help, help this child go into a wonderful adult, right? Those are all kind of worldly purposes. But our, our divine purpose is higher than that. It's when we are doing what we love and at the same time, serving humanity, helping the world out. And we're, we know we're in our purpose when we're in the flow. And the tricky thing is, it's not so much about what we do as in how we do it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I could, there, there are four yoga paths, right? And we're each on this path if you picture it like a four lane freeway, this is the best way to describe it. It's a four lane freeway taking us from where we are now to where we want to be. So where we want to be could be, you could call it enlightenment. You could call it um, the highest truth. You could call it, um, you know, the knowledge being, you know, super smart, whatever, our goal is in life to achieve this highest state that we can be in, in this lifetime. So all along the way on this freeway, there are, there's scenery, right? So it doesn't matter what lane we're in. We're all seeing the same scenery and the scenery. Those are the lessons that we're learning. So we're all learning the same lessons. But as you know, when you drive down a freeway, sometimes you notice something and the other person doesn't notice it, right? And you notice this and you're like, oh, did, oh no, I didn't see that. I was looking at that, right? Yeah. That's kind of how life is. All these lessons are there for us. And at some point, we will learn all of them. But these lanes are based on our kind of personality and kind of our own nature. And although we can change lanes at any time, based on our personality, there's one lane that will kind of favor for the whole ride. So let me just break it down into what those four lanes are, okay? Yes, please. So, okay, so think of it this way. The first lane is called bhakti yoga. Yoga means to unite, right? From where we are to where we want to be. Bhakti yoga is the path of love and devotion. So people who are bhaktas, who practice bhakti yoga, they are all about the love. They have these big hearts. You know, they just love people. They love life. They want to embrace life. 
there's this old Vedic story that says that uh, a classroom of students um, was taking a field trip and they were on the bus and the teacher was saying, well, today we're going to a mango grove and I want you to get out of the bus and study the mango trees and then come back and tell me what you found out about them. So the students all get off the bus and some of them are examining the leaves and they're using a microscope and some of them are measuring the tree and the branches and some of them are writing down the color of the fruit and all that kind of stuff. They're studying these trees. But the bhakta goes up to the mango tree, plucks a ripe mango and <laughs> bites into it and the juice is dribbling all down her chin. That's a bhakta. You just embrace life. You just jump in and you experience it. And bhaktas learn through their relationships. Um, bhaktas really, the, the point is with bhaktas is they love, but what they're loving is the divine within. So they can look in a person's eyes and say, I love you. And what they, they know that what they're loving is the divine within that person. Mm -hmm. They know that love comes from the divine and it's that connection with the divine to the divine that um, gives them that feeling of love. Mm -hmm. So like some people are, um, are very open hearted like that. And those tend to be the ones who are bhaktas, the people who are always, you know, uh, cooking and feeding people, you know, like I know my grandma, she was always in the garden and she loved her flowers and she gave love to the flowers. And when she cooked for us, she gave love to the food and she served us with love. And it was, what else can I do for you? You know, I'm just like, oh, just beautiful, beautiful, all about love, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds like my mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, we all know these boxes. Yep, I love it's it. It's that earth mama kind of type, you know, that they, they want to hug you. Like there's a saint, Amma. I don't know if you know her, her mother, Amma. She's the hugging saint. Mm. And I went to see her once to experience a hug. And <laughs> all she does is, you know, there's lines of people, blocks and blocks and blocks when she comes to town. And the way she expresses to them is she doesn't lecture. She doesn't, you know, um, wash their feet or anything. She, what happens is when she comes to you, she hugs you. And when she hugged me, I immediately got a vision of my grandma. I was like, this is how my grandma used to hug me. You know, it's like you feel the love. It's crazy good. It's amazing. It's amazing. So the next path is called karma yoga and karma yoga is about service. It's about work. It's about activity. So the karma yogi is the person who always wants to do something. When you're in a meeting and a committee meeting or something and it's like, well, this needs to be done. Who's going to do it? They're like, me, I'll do it. I'll do it. You know, they're the first one to volunteer, the first one to jump up. They want to serve. They want to help. It's like, what can I do? How can I help? Right. They're right there. Um, so it can be the person who, you know, organizes the bake sale so that they raise money for the PTA or whatever, but they're the go-to person for um, service. And if somebody's sick, they, they go running over or they make chicken soup and they go running over and they give them the chicken soup. They're, they're that kind of a person. They're always there for, to serve. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of philanthropists, you know, doctors sometimes, they have that personality that they want to serve. They want to heal. They want to help. That kind of thing. Teachers, a lot of them are karma yogis. I'm a karma yogi myself. I can't, I, I'm a very active person. It's like the hardest thing for me to do is nothing. So it's like, I see a problem. I want to fix it, especially if it's affecting somebody, you know, I'm like, Oh my gosh, you know, so that's, that's my go-to path. And I've learned that about myself, you know, when I, and, and you know, your paths can change. So I think when I was a young mother, I was much more on the path of bhakti because I was all about loving these little babies and just spending so much time with them and devoted to them, you know, but then the karma yogi came out as they got older and they're like on their own. I'm like, who else can I help? Who will, you know, <laughs> let's do this. And then the next path is called jnana yoga and it's spelled J-N-A-N-A. -N -A. And that is the path of knowledge. And people who are attracted to this path 
tend to be the intellectuals, mm -hmm. the teachers, the students. They are seeking for knowledge. They're the people who are reading, analyzing, thinking, questioning, um, you know, researching, going deep into it. Um, they're much more the thinkers. They're in their head, whereas the bhaktis are in their heart. The karma yogis are like in their hands, the doing, you know, so everybody has their own like thing. But the main thing with the jnana yogis is they're trying to discern between what is real and what is not real. Mm -hmm. So the whole world can be basically separated into these two things, what is real, what is not real. And what you learn on the path of jnana yoga is that everything in the world, you know, a, a book, a table, my body, whatever, it looks real. Mm -hmm. but it's not real mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's temporary. It has a beginning and an end. It has a cause, right? Something started it, something will end it. That's just the way it goes. The only thing that is real is what lasts forever. What goes on and on with no beginning and no end, no causation. And that is, you can call it the divine, you can call it God, you can call it Brahman, Allah, uh, Jehovah, whatever you want to call it, you know, it's that spirit that lives within each one of us and is in and all around all of us. Mm. So they're trying all the time to discern what is real, what is not real. So they could be at work stressing about this big project they got a deadline it's everything's on the line for the company money's at stake everything but they don't get stressed out because they're, they're like you know what i'm gonna do my best but in the long run none of this is real it's all a play i'm just playing my part i'm going along whatever happens happens once this project is done there's gonna be another project once this president is done, there's going to be another president. <laughs> everything comes, everything goes. Don't get too stressed out about it because mm -hmm. all of that stuff is not real anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what the Gyanis are after. And they do that intellectually. It's like, it's like a mathematician. They have to have a formula. It has to be scientific. They're going to prove that this is the way it is. And and it's been done, you know, in all the Vedic texts and stuff. They systematically break it down to explain why this is true. Right. And then the last path, the fourth path, is called Raja Yoga. And Raja Yoga is the path of meditation. And what this is all about, it's about looking within to discover who we are and what our purpose is, right? And to get that confidence of knowing who we are by looking within. Because from the moment we're born, we are taught to look outside of us. We're taught to see, oh, that's my mom. That's my dad. That's my crib. That's my toy. That's my sister. That This is my house. My, 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 my. Defining who we are by everything outside of us, right? And then we don't want to share our toy because that's my toy, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about looking within through meditation to discover the connection between everyone and everything so that you're not selfish, you're selfless. Mm -hmm. We understand that it's about the unity of the world, not any one single particular person. So the path of meditation is great for uh, monastics are all on this path because they don't really need to go to work and earn a paycheck and raise a family and all that kind of stuff, right? That the other, the other yoga paths have to do. They can, you know, do their um, service that they need to do at the monastery and go into meditation. And everything they do is uh, a part of that path. Raja means royal. So it's like the royal path because you kind of have to be royally supported to, to be on this path, you know, to live on a mountaintop, somebody's got to come and bring you food, right? Mm -hmm. But still, I think a lot of us have that instinct in us. We need time to be quiet. We need time to reflect. 
to settle our minds, you know, to get away from that cacophony of life and the world that the world wants to define us and tell us who we are. No, we have to know who we are, right? We have to define that because when we know that, then we have everything. We have the confidence. Right. We have the, the, you know, the self-esteem. We have ev every gift we could ever want. We're not craving for something more all the time. Mm -hmm. We're not uh, dissatisfied with what we have. We're happy with what we have. And if we want more, we know how to go out and work for it to have more and know that if we don't get that more, we're still okay. Right. You know? So, so that's what it is. So, you know, you mentioned kind of near the beginning that you noticed, right, when you were raising children, right, when they were younger, you were more of a bhakti. Um, and then you you changed, right, when they grew up, grew older. So so for everyone watching right now, like I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, wow, I feel like I'm a blend, you know, I don't feel like one of those is like really like absolutely, you know, who I am. So, so is there, you know, are there lots of different combinations or is there really one like that sticks out in like in a given time in someone's life? Yeah, I think over the course of your life, you're going to change paths. And then when you look back and reflect, you can say, oh, well, kind of the running thread is that I always went over to that bhakti lane, you know, or I always went over to that karma lane. But like students, for example, when you're in college, jnana yoga, you know, because right. you're studying, you're learning, you're absorbing. The thing is, it's like you think you're learning mathematics. You think you're learning atmospheric sciences. You think you're learning, you know, English 101. What are you really learning? You're learning who you are. How does this resonate with you? How does this affect your life? How, what can you garner from this to teach you um, your purpose? Right. What you're supposed to be doing. So it's, it's not all academics. You know, I, I think we think it is, and maybe the universities are there to teach us academics, but if we're doing it right, it's teaching us about who we are and what our purpose is. Mm. So yeah, that's a time we're in Gyana yoga. And if you're ever a teacher, you're in Gyana yoga path, you know, mm -hmm. um, if you're ever a volunteer for anything, you're in the karma yoga path, you know? So if you're consoling a friend from a breakup or, or whatever, you're in the bhakti yoga path. So we, it's a very flex thing. It's a very flex thing. And we learn from each of the paths. It's just in a different way. So I call these like our, our spiritual learning styles. So you can have more than one. You know, some people are auditory learners. Some people are visual learners. But they still learn by listening, right? Or they still learn by looking. So we all have them. Just one tends to be a little stronger. Mm, awesome. Thank you. I love that. That's awesome. I appreciate you diving into that. That's all like beautiful and fascinating. And I hope everybody's, you know, enjoying taking a look at this and, and ultimately for the purpose of right, figuring out who we are and, and therefore right building confidence. Cause like you said in the beginning, the more we know who we are, the more confident we are. So I love it. Um, I'd love it if you dive a little bit into karma um, for a moment, since that's a, that's a word that's thrown around a lot. So obviously, you know, when I think of karma, I think of what goes around, comes around, that kind of stuff, or past lives. And, and that's kind of, so, so tell us about karma. Yeah, karma is all that. But the word karma itself means action. Mm. And taking an action puts us in this karmic cycle, right? So say... Um, I take an action, like I, I, I say, oh, I'm having a chocolate cake for dessert. So I take that action. That action creates a memory. Oh, I like chocolate cake, right? That memory creates a desire. I want chocolate cake, which creates another action. I'm eating chocolate cake, right? So this is called the karmic cycle, and it starts always with an action, we fall into these karmic cycles all the time with our relationships. You know, we see, we may choose the wrong person all the time. It's because that's what we're used to. That's we're stuck and we need to break out of that karmic cycle. So we need to understand who we are to know that we have a myriad of choices that we don't have to 
eat the cake all the time. We can want the cake, but we can stop our, ourselves there. And before we take the action and say, wait a second, there's also lemon meringue. There's also apple pie. There's also, I don't need the calories. And so I can skip it. I could take a bath instead. I could do some aromatherapy and maybe get, you know, what, or maybe why do I want that cake? What is missing in me that it makes me think I want that cake, right? So, I mean, look at all those choices instead of immediately going to, I'm eating the cake, right? Right. So that's kind of where, that's how we get out of the karmic cycle. But karma means action or service. And when we talk about um, our actions from past life, bringing them into the current life, it's it's lessons that we didn't learn before that we need to learn now that we need to learn before we can get enlightened. Mm, so, awesome. and it may, it may not be that we did something wrong because there's no wrong in life. There's no failure in life. It's all steps that lead us towards the highest truth towards knowing who we really are. Mm. So, you know, yeah, we can be sorry and learn from the lesson right? It's not like we have to repeat the lesson over and over and over again. We, we learn from it and move on. We don't have to beat ourselves up for it. We don't have to have regrets all our life and feel like we're terrible people. We're like, yeah, I blew it. I'm owning it. I apologize. I'm not going to do it again. And I learned my lesson. And then you go on. I love it. Thank you so much. And are, are there any last insights that you want to leave everyone with before we hop off? Um, I would say be creative. You know, I, I, people don't know that they're creative sometimes. They think that means being an artist, you know, or something like that. But everyone is a creative being. And we're creating our life every day, every moment by the choices that we make. So, you know, think a little differently, be a little creative, uh, try something new that you haven't done before and see where it leads you. Mm, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. This has been lovely. I appreciate your time and, and talking with us about this today. So thanks for being here. Absolutely. Pleasure. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to Lisa's interview. And here once again is to our collective journey to, to harnessing our inner power and creating unstoppable self-confidence. Bye, everybody. Avaya has changed my life. Avaya has made me the woman I am today. Avaya is my home. Avaya is personal freedom. Avaya is the reason my life continuously improves. Let everyone in your life know about Avaya. Everyone needs to know about this amazing company. Thank you, Avaya, for appearing in my inbox. What Ike Allen and Andy Anderson have created at Avaya is what the world needs. 